Hi, good morning. Thank you for being here on beautiful autumnal New York City day, autumn in New York. We're really delighted to have Dr. Mary O'Sullivan with us today. We want to make sure in our grand rounds we feature some of our most erudite faculty, and Mary certainly sits in that in that esteemed category uh, as an associate professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and as a director of the chest clinic and director of the comprehensive asthma clinic here at Mount Sinai St. Luke's. It's important to note Mary was the founder of the chest clinic, and she's been the director for 35 years. She is a wonderful person, a wonderful clinician, a wonderful example of what it means to be an expert in one's field. And she's exemplified that in many, many different ways. Hey, Mary. <laughs> Another Mary. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, and I, I just wanted to call out a few things. All of you will be familiar with, with Dr. O'Sullivan's work for patients who are struggling with tobacco uh, addiction. And Mary's done wonderful work over the entire course of her time at Mount Sinai St. Luke's, including in spaces you may not be as aware of in the most intractable places that patients find themselves. For example, patients admitted to the psychiatric wards at this hospital. And it's well known that patients with diagnoses like schizophrenia are particularly disadvantaged when it comes to trying to deal with their tobacco dependence. Patients struggling with cancer where smoking has been identified as an obvious problem for them in terms of their cancer treatment, but also an important place that they find solace in their lives. Patients struggling with obesity and asthma and how those two very serious comorbidities feed into each other and how that makes it even more challenging to care for them. Mary's also an innovator. And we're going to hear a little bit about that today, I think, in terms of the biologics she's bringing to bear for patients with severe asthma. But as a separate example, Mary's been a champion for us in terms of new technology called dynamic X-ray and how that might be important modality for us as we understand better what's going on for patients and their lungs. Mary is a wonderful collaborator. And she works across departments and across professions to bring excellence to the care of patients. Psychiatry, I already mentioned, social work, the work she does with patient navigators, the work she does in all areas of the hospital to make sure that patients struggling with lung disease are getting wonderful care. And then finally, Mary is a wonderful mentor. And many in the audience, and literally at this point, probably Mary, thousands of trainees and junior faculty have uh, benefited from her tutelage. And Mary, it's just a privilege to have you with us. We're so proud of all the work you do, and we're looking forward to your talk today. Thank you so much. That's a hard, hard talk, talk to follow. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to see all of you. And we have some really great news because everybody thinks oncology is the hottest field to go into now, but they're wrong. There's great, great things happening in oncology, but what's going on in asthma is extraordinary. And so um, let's have a look. So all asthma is not the same. Asthma is a heterogeneous disease, and that's one of the big features that we want to focus on today. There's a couple of key dividers, age of onset of disease. This is a big issue, separating out patients. Some the progression of the disease, how fast is it progressing? Which inflammatory markers are involved? What kind of response to treatment? Some patients don't respond to the treatment we're given. So we've always used the guidelines. The guidelines work great. Stepwise approach, inhale corticosteroid, add the LABA, works for most people. Works for, well, the majority of patients. But in severe asthma, which is the focus of today's talk, one size does not fit all. And so we have to tease people out to understand what's going on with our patient. Um, airway inflammation determines the disease. Numerous cell types, numerous mediators. Pathways differ for individual patients. And we're going to talk a little bit about T2 and non-T2 inflammation. So we'll come to that. I know it's a, it's a, a concept that's not um, on the tip of our tongues. But patients who have eosinophils versus neutrophils versus no cells in their airway determining what kind of asthma they have and what kind of treatment they need. Um, treatment needs to be targeted 
to as much as we can know about these patients as we can get. So what are our goals for this morning? One, recognize the variable presentations of asthma, highlight the features that separate poorly controlled asthma from severe asthma, identify those patients who would benefit from biologics, and then understand the role of three very simple laboratory tests, which we use all the time, but we should use it to focus who should be getting biologic therapy and what. And those three tests are, and I'll refer to them a million times, CBC with DIF, Vino, which we'll discuss, and IgE and RAS testing. And in EPIC, if you're in EPIC, the way you order IgE and RAS testing is you put in asthma and then asthma profile comes up. And from that simple evaluation, we can determine what biologics the patient may or may not benefit from. So steroids are a disease unto themselves. And we all know that. We've all used them to the benefit and detriment of our patients. 45% of patients with severe asthma use systemic steroids to control the disease and prevent exacerbations. We know that. But steroids are non-selective, multi-organ toxic effects, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia, premature coronary disease, arrhythmias, osteoporosis, avascular necrosis, psychiatric disease, eye disease, broad immunosuppression. Steroids are a disease unto themselves. Have you ever made a patient look like that? Yep, we do it all the time. And that patient suffers from all the things that you can see right there on his face. You could barely tell if he's female or male. You can see the rash, you can see the obesity, um, you can see hirsutism. You could often see, practically see depression, right? And we do this to our patients with severe asthma. We're doing things, we're trying to do the best we can, but now we have other options. And that picture is the picture to go home with that we'd want to avoid doing this to our patients. So about 10 years ago, Dr. Moore uh, was looking at severe asthma. And you don't need, this is just an example of, of what she did. There's, there's no detail in here that I want you to get. What she did though, was she teased out what are the different pathophysiologies? What are the different uh, presentations? So if you have low FEV1, high FEV1. But the thing that she really highlighted and that was very, very important for the future was age of onset. And she could see that age of onset made a difference in the kind of asthma you had and in the kind of treatment you should get. So we go from there and the initial thing in our evaluation of a patient, and this is not the focus of the talk, but I do mention it, is does the patient have asthma? And certainly we want to make a careful evaluation of that and do history reactive and reversible, get your PFTs, you may need a methylcholine challenge, exercise challenge, exclude other causes. That's all I'm going to say about does the patient have asthma, because we really want to focus on the patient who has severe asthma. So what is severe asthma? Poor symptom control with frequent severe exacerbations with two bursts of systemic steroids equal to or greater than two times a year. Now think in your practices, how many patients do you have like that? I would say there's a bunch of them. And so going on prednisone two times a year, you do that for 10 years, you've gained 20 pounds, maybe 30. Your bones have gone, right? So we wanna think about this category of people. The big question is how many times in the last year have you had steroids? And that puts us in that I'm worried about you category. Have you had a hospitalization? Have you had an ICU stay? How bad is your PFT? Is your asthma barely controlled on inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonist? How, if you're on prednisone, I can't reduce the prednisone. Every time I reduce your prednisone, you get sick. These are the patients with very serious asthma. And so these are the ones we want to highlight for consideration for additional therapies. So difficult to control asthma, we have to think about a number of differentials. We have to tease out what's a poorly controlled patient versus a patient who truly has severe disease. That's asthma is the disease. So is the diagnosis correct? Are the meds being taken properly? You all know that that's... 80% of asthma is, are the meds being taken properly in education there? Compliance, call the pharmacy. Oh, you haven't filled your inhaler in three months. I guess we better do that before we start thinking about advanced treatments. 
GERD, anti-inflammatory meds adequate? Maybe you need to be on a higher dose of inhaled corticosteroids. Do you have sinusitis? Are you living with cat, dog, mice, mold, roaches, etc.? Do you work with cat, dog, mice, mold, roaches? What are you breathing in? What's your air like? Is your air pro-inflammatory? Maybe there's a subgroup of ABPA. Is there an unrecognized allergen? Um, are you taking a beta blocker in significant dose? So these things, we want to fix these things we, before we start thinking about, is this someone who needs to be on a biologic? We want to make the distinction between severe, poorly controlled asthma and true severe disease itself. So poor control due to other factors other than asthma itself, non-adherence and correct technique, comorbidities. This is 90 to 95% of serious asthma. But 10 to 15% is that the disease is very, very severe. So asthma, cause of difficult asthma addressed and excluded, but still have poor control, two courses of steroids a year, despite high intensity treatment. So what evaluation do we pursue? Well, we get a PFT, pre and post, lung volumes, diffusion capacity. We get the three basic tests, an IgE rest, a CBC with diff, and a pheno. If you want to order a pheno in EPIC, you write in nitric oxide. You don't write in pheno. If you write in nitric oxide, it comes right up. It doesn't, you can't write it into the PFT requisition. Evaluation of pharmacy records to make sure the patient is really taking their meds. Maybe a methacholine challenge, maybe laryngoscopy to look for vocal cord dysfunction, high resolution CT to look for bronchiectasis, check for GERD, sinus CT, cardiac eval. These are all things that come into play when we're looking at patients with severe asthma. And then we have our nice step up, which we've used for a million years. We're very happy with that. Um, step one, step two, step three, step four. Step five has changed. Now, this is GINA guidelines, 2019, right? So what are we seeing here? High-dose ICS lava, teotropium, helpful in decreasing exacerbations and severe asthma. And then we see anti-IgE, whoops, where is my, anti-IgE, that's been there for a while. But then we also see anti-IL-5, IM-5 receptor, anti-IL-4, IL-13, and bronchial thermoplasty. Well, that's quite a distinct addition to the, to the playing field. And then we have the sexiest thing of all, which is as needed inhaled corticosteroid for motor oil for rescue. This is really hot. The patients knew this a long time ago. They've been doing it for years. But now GINA guidelines are recommending that we can use ICS for motor oil for rescue. But that worked for a lot of patients. We want to see how do we figure out who is going to wind up with newer, newer kinds of treatment. So our previous concept, which we're all very familiar with, was atopic asthma, bronchodilator responsive, childhood onset, heavily allergic, IgE, atopic, but not all asthma fits this picture. The allergic pathway was not the key to all severe asthma, especially with adult onset. So again, we're coming back to that age of onset being a big player here. The newer concepts in trying to divide up the patients is age of onset, presence of nasal polyps, biomarkers, the three biggie, EOs, pheno, IgE, the presence of eosinophils versus neutrophils versus very few cells in the airway. So what about these biomarkers that I keep mentioning? Okay, blood eosinophils, which we can measure with the CBC with TIFF, we use as a surrogate for sputum eosinophils. We can't get sputum eosinophils. Even main mounts are not can't get sputum for eosinophilia. It's very expensive and a, mainly a research tool. But blood eosinophils, serum eosinophils, is a good surrogate. Now, when you look at your CBC with diff and look at the percentages, you'll say nobody has eosinophilia because the percentages of normal are looking at it from a very different vantage point. We're looking at it from an asthma vantage point. So don't look at the percentage, look at the absolute. And so uh, over 150 cells of eosinophils is considered significant eosinophilia when we're looking at asthma. So this is very different. So I know in the clinic, everybody said, no, no eosinophilia, but you wanna be looking at the absolute. Okay, and for some of the targeted therapies, they want 300. But some of them, they don't even quantitate what, what 
be a synthol count group they want. But what you want to do is you want to say, is my patient in the category of an eosinophilic asthma? And so over 550, that's on the low side. You get to 200, you get to 300, then you're, you're looking at an eosinophilic patient. And you want to do that when they're not on prednisone. Because when you do it on prednisone, they have no eosinophils at all, right? So get the look and see what was the eosinophils over time. Um, and then the cytokines that we're going to be referring to um, are IL-5, IL-4, and IL-13. So three cytokines to keep in mind for this talk. Um, and you have your native cells that under the influence of IL-5, you have increased eosinophil differentiation. And under the influence of IL, let me get the marker, IL-4, IL-5, and 13, eosinophil, eosinophil tracking to the tissues. So we have three markers, and these are going to be important markers because these are the very markers that the drugs target. They're going to be targeting the differentiation of eosinophils and the migration of the eosinophils. So what is pheno? I keep mentioning pheno. Exhaled nitric oxide. So we always think about nitric oxide as something we see in as a treatment for pulmonary hypertension, a vasodilator. But in the airway, it's a very different thing. Um, it's produced by the epithelial cells. It corresponds to eosinophilic inflammation in the airway. It's produced by a nitric oxide nitric oxide synthase, which is regulated by TH, T2 cytokines, especially IL-13, one of the ones we're looking at all the time. So IL-13 is very strongly related to nitric oxide levels. The test itself is very simple, unlike most PFTs, which are really, really difficult for patients to do. You just have to go, that's it, that's the whole test. It takes about 20 seconds. Uh, but it gives you a wealth of information. So you, you know your patient can't do a PFT, but they could do that. And so send them for a pheno uh, and write in nitric oxide, not pheno. Um, and then what does the, the result mean? Less than 20, either their asthma is extremely well controlled or they don't have asthma. Okay, so we have interpretation over here. If it's over 50, definitely uncontrolled eosinophilic inflammation. If it's between 25 and 50, it's indeterminate. And if it's less than 20, it's less likely eosinophilic inflammation or steroid responsive. So sometimes mm -hmm. patients are, 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 have um, very low eosinophil eos and nitric oxide. Sometimes they have super high. And when I, ha when I see a super high nitric oxide, I think that the people in clinic know what I do. I go back and I say to the patient, are you really taking your medicines? Because that's also a ticket to say uncontrolled eosinophilia is because you're not taking your medicine. And so that, that's a, a little sneaky thing from clinic. Uh, but it winds up to be true that if you're not taking your medicine, your pheno is going to be high. So, but anyway, 25 to 50 indeterminate, less than 20, either well controlled or you don't have asthma. So IgE. Our third biomarker, elevated level can predict asthma diagnosis in some patients. It certainly identifies an atopic subgroup, higher levels associated with eosinophilia and phenol, determines eligibility for anti-IgE treatment, which we are all familiar with, elmalizumab or Zolair. However, the level of IgE does not predict how well they respond to Zolair, which is interesting. That is more related to the level of phenol. Antigen-specific IgE levels can be helpful in planning antigen avoidance. So if you're very allergic to your cat and you've come back with a class 5 cat allergy on your panel, you know you better get rid of the cat. So it's useful. It's also useful in identifying ABPA as a subgroup. But what does it do is it tells us that this patient is an allergic patient. So we talk about type 2 and non-type 2 asthma. So what does that mean? because it's sort of, a, a, I think, a confusing uh, way of thinking about things, type 2 and non-type 2. Uh, but anyway, type 2 means that the lymphocytes have, are, have been turned down by IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, affecting eosinophil production, survival, and IgE. So those three cytokines are in the type 2 asthma, and that includes a group of patients who have also atopy, very high IgE. So here's a um, 
chart that was developed. So you can remember Moore's chart originally where it had the, they're dividing up. This chart is different. This chart has more subtleties to it. And I think it's important for us to go through it. I'll refer to it a couple of times in the, in the course of this morning. So on the x-axis, we have, I don't know if you can see it, it sort of got cut off down here. It is cut off. It's age of onset <laughs> down here at the bottom, okay? Age of onset, so childhood onset, adult onset, adult onset. Severity is over here, okay? So you have TH2, remember that's lip eosinophils uh, IL-4513. Non-TH2 is neutrophils, no cells, palsy granulocytic, we'll talk about it a little more. So this is our, child, this is our classic asthma. This is childhood onset, allergic, IgE, plenty of allergy, maybe have anaphylaxis, hives, are very allergic. And we've been taking care of these people for a very long time, and we know well how to do it. Exercise-induced asthma under that um, wing. This is the group. That's the group we're focusing on today. And that's late-onset eosinophilic asthma. Uh, they have adult onset. They have eosinophils, and you can see in terms of severity score, it's high up here. These patients have severe asthma, and they have severe asthma right from the get-go. They don't start off with a little bit of asthma that creeps up on them. These are people who get a bad cold in their 40s, let's say. They get a bad cold, and for the next three years, they're on and off with wheezing and bronchitis and asthma. Uh, and they're wondering, where did the asthma come from at this age? That's who we're talking about. Then over here is a group we're not going to focus on, but you should know about them. Very late onset in women. Obesity associated. Now, this obesity associated isn't the person who became obese because they had really bad asthma, and we kept giving them prednisone, and they got obese. This is, these are patients who the obesity is driving the asthma, right? So that's where, then we're talking about leptin, and an inflammatory cascade that's very different. And the, I guess the important point here is this is not going to respond to prednisone. And we want to be very cautious when we're giving prednisone to our obese patients that we're not doing them harm and that we, we're really sure that they do have an underlying inflammatory asthma, eosinophilic asthma, and it's not just the obesity that's driving the wheezing. Smoking-associated neutrophilic. They should stop smoking. Smooth muscle-mediated with palsy granulocytic. So palsy granulocytic, that means they have very few cells. It's smooth muscle. So we don't know what about these people. We're kind of confused about these people. Did they just have really bad asthma at some point in their life and they got so much drugs that there are no more cells left in their airway? If we do a biopsy, maybe we're biopsying too proximally and the inflammatory cells are way distal. We don't know. But what we do know about this group of patients is they don't respond to steroids. So we shouldn't be giving them steroids. We need newer drugs. We don't have them yet. We have some things we can do for these patients, but it's very important that we recognize them so we can, again, tease out, make, make your treatment as focused as you can. We're going to come back to this slide again. Um, and, okay. So adult onset. So we're, we're focusing on this, these gals in here. Okay, mainly women. Varying definition of onset of age. So adult onset. Some of the articles say adulthood starts at 12. Others go 40. Um, it's not clear to me the strict definition of what adult onset asthma is, but it's not childhood, I can tell you that. They have this adult onset group have a less allergic profile. They still have allergies, but it's not like the, they're allergic to everything on the panel. Often, often following a lower respiratory infection, severe from the onset, so this is asthma that's life-changing. It's not the, this is one that you get it and now I'm, I'm sick frequently. Um, and, and so I want you to keep that in mind. Early exposure to infections may be protective. You know, you build up your immunity back then. Has a more severe clinical course than uh, allergic asthma. Low remission rate, faster decline in lung function, lower lung function at time of diagnosis. Often occurs in females. The, the IgE is variable. They can have IgE, but they don't have to. And the pheno is present and associated with nasal polyps. 
So I want you to think for a second and think, how many patients do you know who fit this, who fit this panel? I bet you there's some there. And I know I see them and I'm always sort of surprised. Oh, here's another one and another one and another one. Because before I had my blinders on and I was seeing everybody like the childhood onset. And now I'm realizing that there's really a, a very significant group of people, mainly women, um, with adult onset. And this is what a nasal polyp looks like. I showed that to my husband last night. He said, ooh. <laughs> but looking in the nose is really um, an important feature. Uh, nasal polyps strongly correlate with the presence of pheno, with the presence of eosinophilia. So it's an important thing to be aware of. And you may not see this, but the patient can tell you, oh, yeah, I've had nasal polyp surgery three times. <laughs> OK. So just to, to put it, recap a little bit, type 2, eosinophilic, so one, half to two thirds of, of severe asthma have persistent large airway eosinophils. Could be early or late. Early is the one we're used to, used to dealing with. Late is the ones we're focusing on today. And then we have the, the, the ones that are on the right side of that chart, which is not steroid, non -t type two, neutrophilic. Um, they may have some eosinophils in there, or uh, palsy inflammatory. They have no inflammatory cells on biopsy. So here we have a patient. Where does this patient fit? 50-year-old female, never smoker with two years of intermittent severe shortness of breath and wheezing, especially following upper respiratory infections, severe sinus disease, nasal polyps, no childhood asthma or allergies, PFT with a moderate mild reduction of FEV1, pheno is 70, insufficient response to Simbacort and albuterol, compliant with meds, excellent technique, no exposure, she reigns sick with albuterol rescue daily, and three courses of prednisone this year. She's gained 15 pounds and developed diabetes. Preocephal count is 60 when um, she is on prednisone, but 600 when she is off prednisone. So this is the person we're talking about. Again, she would fit here uh, in this late onset eosinophilic adult onset severe asthma. So. We look at total IgE levels, we look at IL-5, we look at IL-4, and we look at IL-13. Let's focus a little bit on the IL-5, 4, and 13. So the IL-5 regulates the eosinophil production and maturation. So we have two drugs that target IL-5. We have mepolizumab and we have benrolizumab. Mepolizumab targets uh, the IL-5, the eosinophil itself. IL-5 receptor is what benrolizumab, benrolizumab targets. Then we have IL-4 and IL-13. These two work together. And so the drug that we have links both of these. So IL-4 directs the lymphocytes to make IgE. And IL-13 leads the airway eosinophilia, but also, and this is interesting, uh, uh, increases mucous gland hyperplasia, airway fibrosis, and remodeling. So this component here adds a lot to the panel of what it's, what it's driving. So these two are, are drive this eosinophil, eosinophil and uh, IgE. This one is eosinophil and airway inflammation. So an important um, cytokine. Here's a picture. Mercifully, they put the left side on the left side and the right side on the right side. So it still correlates with TH2 and non-TH2. So TH2 inflammation, that's our eosinophils. Non-type 2 uh, is the neutrophils or palsy granulocytic. So we have IL-4, IL-5, IL-13. IL-4 telling the B cell to make IgE. IL-5 and IL-13 talking to the eosinophil, telling it to develop or to go to the airway. And then IL-13 talking to the airway itself increasing hyperresponsiveness, remodeling mucus production, smooth muscle constriction, and hypertrophy. So three cytokines to focus on. Again, the same thing, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13. This is an old slide. This is so interesting. I was looking at slides, and I put it in because it's an old slide. Yet it had the features that we're talking about. Early onset, late onset, a little bit of eosinophilia, a lot of eosinophilia, allergic, not as low lung function, lots of allergy, as opposed to late onset, and IL-4513 and some IgE. 
post-infectious occupational asthma, lower lung function, more rapid decline, skin test positive much of the time, more use, and it feels more symptoms. Late onset, early onset, same thing. So a word on the, on the non-type 2, the, the people on the right-hand side of the, of the chart, with neutrophilic or palsy granulocytic. No biomarkers. The biomarkers are negative. They don't have eosinophilia. They don't have pheno. They don't have IgE. It's associ associated with obesity, smoking, infection, lack of response to steroids. So the mediators for this kind of asthma, immunoglobulins, cellular cytotoxicity, macrophage activation, it's a different disease. Okay? Treatment, weight loss, bariatric surgery. If they're neutrophilic, consider macrolide antibiotics, long-term low-dose macrolides. In fact, recent studies said that we can do that in all asthmatics. But in, if, neutroph if neutrophilic on the, the right side of that chart, low-dose antibiotics, secretion clearance, pulmonary rehab. If it's palsy granulocytic, if there's no inflammatory cells there, increase the bronchodilators and even consider bronchial thermoplasty, which is just going to... to um, weaken the airway wall, so thin the airway wall, so it can be bigger. Newer drugs are in development, so there will be targeted therapy in the future, but right now we don't have that. We're really dealing with very basic uh, issues here. But I think the important thing that's not here is we're not giving them steroids. So looking at the drugs, we have omalizumab. We're all familiar with that. Great drug. Recombinant anti-IgE binds to... Uh, IgE with high infinity, and then it makes this biologically inert immune complex. So it doesn't, it's not, it's just there, and the IgE is still there, but um, it's inert. And it binds to the IgE, so the IgE does not bind to mast cells and basophils and dendritic cells, it blocks their activation, results in a marked reduction of free IgE, not IgE total, but free IgE, down regulation of the receptors, reduction in tissue eosinophils, reduction in bronchial IgE. The eligibility for uh, omalizumab is an IgE range of 35 to 700 or positive to perennial allergens. The, the top number here of 700 is not a strict one. You usually can get it for patients with I, IgE higher than that. It's administered sub-Q every two to four weeks. Sorry, with a dose determined by the level of the IgE. We use it add on start to steroids, and then we can stabilize the patient and gradually decrease the steroids. Quality of life improves, reduces exacerbations by 50%. And about 30% of allergic asthmatics respond. So it's not everybody. It's not everybody. It doesn't work for everybody. Response is related to how much the level of pheno you have, which is very interesting. So we thought that people were at risk for anaphylaxis uh, when they got omalizumab. So omalizumab patients carry an EpiPen. Uh, but it turns out in, in bigger studies that that risk for anaphylaxis was really not a greater than a placebo effect. But you still have to give the patient a prescription for an EpiPen, and they have to bring it with them when they go for their shot. Um, so that's a little, a little trick that they play on us. EpiPen is required. Here's a study that looked at who, who was responding best to omalizumab in terms of reduction in asthma exacerbation. And the predictor that was the best response was the pheno. So pheno is very useful for telling you you're in, in that, in that um, category. So we have patients on omalizumab for years. Can we stop it? Uh, and that was looked at um, in a study uh, that looked, took 176 patients who'd been on, on omalizumab for many years and gave half of them placebo and half of them omalizumab for the next year. And so the patients who continued with the omalizumab had, um, more, uh, were more ex exacerbation-free than the patients who stopped the omalizumab. But noteworthy, 47% of the patients, even though there was a difference if you continued or not, 47% it remain stable. So patients will get a long-term benefit, and, and we need to know better. I mean, there's, there's clearly more work to do that, you know, keep a person on an injection every two weeks for 
the rest of their life is a big commitment, uh, will we be able to stop some of these drugs? And I think the answer is we will. Or we certainly will be able to stop them for a period of time and then maybe need to go back to them or not. We don't know the answer to that. There is a small higher incidence of cardiovascular cerebrovascular events in the omalizumab versus the non-omalizumab cohort, but the number of severe asthma events is way different. So again, something that needs further study. Mepolizumab. So remember IL-5. So what I send to the, the residents in clinic, the way you remember IL-5 is that it stops asthma. So you can remember the five. It's, anyway, target IL-5. Eosinophil development, maturation, and action uh, indicates severe indicated in severe uncontrolled, we said what uncontrolled was, asthma, with a high blood eosinophil count. Half-life is 20 days. Bloody eosinophil count by, decreases by 50%, decreases exacerbations by 50%, reduction of oral corticosteroid, oral corticosteroid use by 50%. Once a month in injection, you're advised to get the shingles vaccine before you start it, if you can find it in your pharmacy. Our patients who've been gone on mepolizumab, every single one of them have come off steroids. It's an amazing drug, amazing drug. Um, in the three big studies, DREAM, Sirius, and Mensa, again, it was a 50% reduction in everything, um, uh, decreased rate of exacerbations, um, decreased um, need for additional steroids, uh, and improved asthma control score. Benralizumab, again, we've got IL-5, but this one is NL5 receptor. Works very, very well. It knocks out the eosinophil completely. It actually, the, it's um, a, a cytotoxic to the eosinophil. So the, uh, it actually, the eosinophil are gone. So you give the shot and you do a, a CBC with diff the next day and the eosinophil count is zero. This is a very dramatic drug. Um, works very, very well. Reduces the eosinophil count within 24 hours and persists for at least 12 weeks. Big studies, Shiroko, Kalima, this drug, they want you to have eosinophils over 300. That's the requirement for approval. It significantly reduces exacerbation, improves pre-bronchodilator FEV1. Uh, the best responders are high exacerbation rates and eosinophil counts. In the Zonda trial, it did not improve FEV1, but did decrease, increase exacerbation rate. 20% of patients don't respond. Doesn't work in everyone. Reduction of asthma exacerbations in steroid dose by 50%. So this is a very powerful mm -hmm. drug. Um, so we have two drugs that are going to decrease IL-5. Uh, and how do you choose? Well, we don't know. But let's talk, go to the next drug, and then we'll... No, we can, we can talk about Oma, Lizabab versus Mepo versus Benra here. So I've asked this question at, at ATS... Um, all the time, and the biggest people in asthma are there, and some people, I ask the question and I get a sort of an answer, and then Sally Wenzel, normal will know who I'm talking about, but she's like the queen of biology, biologics and asthma. She said the way to think about it is the way the drugs were developed. So amalizumab was initially developed for the childhood onset, and the benralizumab and the mepolizumab were developed for that circle of eosinophilic adult onset, um, adult onset asthma. So even though they were developed for one group and developed for another group, we don't know how, they, how the overlap is. But what the practice has been to use the omelizabab more for the atopic early onset and to use the MEPO and the BENRA for the adult onset. But we don't have comparisons. We don't have studies that compare these drugs yet. And she said that we probably won't because of different drug companies, et cetera, et cetera. So you can be eligible for all three drugs. And so you want to look, certainly you want to look at the pheno, and the pheno is going to say, okay, this person is really eosinophilic, but they also will respond to omalizumab. You want to look at maybe they can only come once a month, they can come once every two months, once every two months is venralizumab, once a month is nebulizumab, and sometimes omalizumab is once every two weeks. So that may come into your decision, very practical things. Um, 
you may start the patient on one drug and they get better, but they don't get fully better. And you may say, let me see if we can switch to another one. So this is, this is a, a place of research right now. And I'll show you at the end, there is a, an attempt to compare the two by looking, by you know, comparing, combining studies and try to say which drug was which better. Uh, but we don't have a good answer to that question. We just have the answer, this was who this was developed for. This was developed for adult onset. This was developed for childhood onset. Um, in, in a double-blind re re randomized controlled trial, literature review, a literature review of double-blind randomized controlled trials, when they, uh, there was no significant difference between treatments and clinically significant exacerbations requiring hospitalization uh, between omalizumab and mepolizumab. But at the end of the, the trial, the trend favored mepolizumab at least as, at least as efficacious as om omalizumab, com comparable effects on lung function, similar toler tolerability profile. So I think that uh, the consensus is that these drugs are, they are all very good and they all have a very good safety profile. Um, and the, the use of the bio, the anti-IL-5s are, are clinically very, very dramatic. Um, so I think we need more information. These, these things are coming out. This was 2017, but these things are coming out as we speak. So um, we have to be careful because they're very, very expensive, and, um, but very, very effective. One second. Dupilumab. This is the drug that targets both IL-4 and IL-13. And everyone is very interested and excited about this drug. Um, it's approved for eosinophilic asthma or type 2 asthma and for atopic asthma. Uh, so remember that um, IL-4 also affects the production of IgE. So it affects the lymphocytes and the production of IgE. Moderately severe asthma can get this drug. You don't have to be... Um, very severe, and you don't have to be steroid dependent, although steroid dependence will get you proved for this drug. It also works for atopic dermatitis, which is interesting because the other drugs do not help with patients' eczema. Many of our patients who have severe asthma also have eczema, and this is the drug that helps with both the asthma and the eczema. So you can, you can prescribe this drug for eczema alone, for atopic dermatitis alone. You don't have to have asthma at all. Uh, nasal polyposis, again, you can give this drug for nasal polyposis alone. Uh, so um, some of our patients who are very, very severe nasal polyposis, we're thinking about transferring them to dupilumab um, to see if we can get a better response. Greater benefit in patients with the high pheno and the eosinophilia. No cutoff for eosinophils for approval. Reduces the T2 biomarkers. Pheno comes down by 30%. IgE comes down by 52%. May have a role in preventing airway remodeling. Because remember, we said that IL-13 not only affects the eosinophil, it also affects airway remodeling and mucous gland hyperplasia and muscles, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this drug has a very nice profile. Um, and again, safety is quite good. So here's a, a schema of... Um, the IL-4, IL-13 duo. The B-cell, IL-4 telling the B-cell to make IgE. So that gets blocked. The um, airway recruitment of eosinophils gets blocked. The uh, smooth enhancement of smooth muscle contractility gets blocked. Airway remodeling with goblet cell hyperplasia, fibroblast production, smooth muscle proliferation collagen de deposition. That's under IL-13's purview, and that gets blocked. Um, so um, mucus and mucus production gets blocked, which is a big issue for asthmatics. So this drug, this is the newest one that's become available, um, has a, a, a potential to be a very powerful tool. So they put the three drugs together, um, attempting to comp compare them, even though they haven't been compared in Combined, st in combined studies, but they're taking the data from different studies and trying to put it together to cobble together some guidelines for us, who do you give what to? Um, so um, <clears throat> these were patients, they took studies that had, 
the prednisone dose at screening was 12, 10, 10. So they tried to get steroid dependent patients who were being controlled with a low dose or a relatively low dose of steroids. And then the, what they looked at dose reduction, who came off steroids completely, exacerbation reduction versus placebo. What's very interesting here um, is the placebo effect. In all of these studies, there's enormous placebo effect. And you have to come and show up to get your shot, even if it's a placebo. And that seems to have a significant effect on people. So um, this is very interesting. Uh, so dose and screening um, for the placebos were similar. So 14, 14 out of the 69 patients uh, came off steroids altogether, but eight out of 66 patients came off steroids. 30 out of 145 came off completely, 10 out of 75 came off. 52 out of 100 came off completely, but 29 out of 100 came off completely. Amazing placebo effect. So where do we stand with this? Um, exacerbation reduction, 32%, 55%, 59%. Exacerbation reduction is, is very significant in these drugs. Median dose reduction, so some people didn't come off the steroids, but they were able to get their dose reduced. So 50%, 75%, and 100%, this is for dupilumab. So we really, we really need more information, don't we? Um, it's, uh, these are very good drugs, and any of you have taken care of patients on them. The patient gets their life back. They've been living in steroid land, ER visits, hospitalizations, and um, they go on these drugs, and there is just this extraordinary change in their life. But we need more data to say how do we use them uh, and, um, and why is there such a placebo effect. So how are you going to, how are you going to think about this? Uh, this little panel, is it, you have a sheet which has actually much of what I'm saying on it. But um, so if you have allergic eosinophilic asthma, really an IgE eosinophilic asthma, you can go on omelizumab, you can go on dupilumab, but you can go on the other drugs too because you've got eosinophils. If you have an allergic non-eosinophilic asthma, that's the childhood onset, you go on either omelizumab or dupilumab because they both affect IgE. If you have um, eosinophilic asthma, but you don't respond to IgE treatment or you're non-allergic, you can go on any of these drugs. But if you're out of the dosing range for IgE treatment, um, this is another reason to go for these drugs. If you're oral corticosteroid dependent, that's for an indication all on its own for dupilumab. You don't have to do anything but just be steroid dependent, and you'll get approval for dupilumab. Again, atopic dermatitis, dupilumab, urticaria, omalizumab, chronic rhinositis, nasal polyps, dupilumab are the targeted drugs. So you get your patient better, and then you stop the steroids. So I had that happen. I, one of the patients, I'm off steroids. I said, oh, my God, this person's been on prednisone 20 for at least five years and just stopped his prednisone. <laughs> are you alive? <laughs> so we do have to taper them. They are adrenally insufficient. So I put this slide here. A key point, this is what they did in the studies. They wrote reduced by 10 milligrams every four weeks, uh, going down by five milligrams. Then they go down to five milligrams. You know the drill, 2.5 milligrams. So you've got to taper the steroids slowly because you really are looking at adrenal insufficiency. And this is, this is um, a um, for, uh, forest plot of meta-analyses meta now. These are not studies that did comparisons. But risk of exacerbation uh, and change in FEV1. Okay, and these, this is dupilumab versus placebo, mepolizumab versus placebo, resolizumab versus placebo, benralizumab, omalizumab versus placebo. So they all did better than placebo. Uh, and when you get over here, um, omalizumab versus resolizumab, we don't use it because it's IV. Uh, there was a, a, a benefit to the, but not significant. None of this is significant down here. Only these ones are significant. So by this, it makes dupilumab look like it has the uh, best chance of decreasing exacerbations. If you look over here where we talk about change in FEV1, dupilumab versus placebo seem to have the, the biggest impact. Resolizumab, mepolizumab, benralizumab, omalizumab. 
they're all significant. Then you look at dupilumab versus omalizumab, and dupilumab did do better than omalizumab, better than benralizumab, better than mepolizumab. Uh, but this is meta-analysis. So we don't have that information. Um, sorry. So, um, so this is where we are with these drugs and trying to choose. I think that uh, I think the most important thing is that being aware that the patient is in that category of of type two eosinophilic asthma and is going to need biologics uh, to get them better. Um, and then the, the teasing out of which biologics is is a little bit uh, difficult, uh, but. It's not, it's not that difficult because most patients can benefit from any of them. I think we tend to use the anti-IL-5 and the anti-IL-413 more than we did the omalizumab. And again, it's because that was the tradition that those, that drug was for the childhood onset and these drugs are for the adult onset. Um, one word about the, the, um, the, the, the patients who are on the far right and the issue of bronchial thermoplasty. Um, it's a technique where you go in and you um, uh, treat the muscle uh, to thin the muscle out so the airways open. Um, it has a really large placebo effect too. So we don't know really if that's something that we should be offering those patients. Uh, it is now recommended though, it's mentioned on the guidelines. So that's, that's actually a big step that it's recommended on the guidelines. So I'd be happy to take questions. Um, at that point, I think um, we've tried to highlight a group of patients that I think are under-recognized, uh, and we have these really, really very significant pathways and options that we can offer them now. At some expense, um, not small expense, one shot of benralizumab costs $4,700, one shot. However, um, if they never go in the hospital again, which many of our patients have had that experience, um, it's well worth it. Um, the, we have most insurances, medic, managed Medicaid is covering these drugs pretty well. The problem, mm -hmm. the patients with the most difficulty are the Medicare patients who uh, don't have a secondary insurance, then we're in big trouble because the copay becomes crazy. Um, we do apply for grants to get coverage for those patients, but that is, that is an issue. Uh, the infusion suite has been very helpful in trying to help us get those grants. Uh, they have the finance department to help us with that. So it's a doable undertaking. It's, it sounds insanely expensive, but it's actually a quite doable undertaking. So I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Mary, for a wonderful presentation, bringing us up to date to where we are. I think it's amazing. Excellent. Uh, uh, but I want to ask a couple of questions. One is, has anyone looked at the environmental factors that add as triggers? Because as the world becomes smaller and the pollution becomes bigger, oh, yeah. we're learning much more about the small part. Oh, absolutely. This is major and impact. That plays into these uh, exacerbations. It's a major impact. Yeah. No question. You made allusion to virus infections, which are extremely common. And clearly, children who develop bronchiolitis at an early age have a much higher incidence of their flare-up and long-lasting uh, bronchodilator-responsive airway disease, whatever you want to call it. Um, but whether or not they fit in the same categories uh, in terms of the consequences of eosinophilia, IgD, etc. And the last thing is, talk about women, and does menopause play a role, and what are the role of hormones in, in this complex disorder? Well, the hormones definitely play a role. We know that asthma can get worse premenstrual. Um, where, why it is women, um, women's airways are smaller than men's airways and in adulthood, so that may be part of it, but I think there definitely is a hormonal underpinning here. We know that there's that overlap. Uh, and we definitely know it for premenstrual uh, time that asthma def and inflammation gets worse. Uh, airway pollution is definitely part of, of what we live with now, and there's lots of studies looking at that. For children, children who get infections uh, and don't get treated for their infections, you know, they sort of fight them off, they do better um, if they get, um, if depending on they, if, you, if they have the exposure and they develop their T1 system or their non-T2 system, 
they do better in terms of not going on to develop eosinophilic asthma than the children who have gotten a lot of treatment um, and the, at, in an early age. So being conservative in the treatment of infections in childhood actually is good for the child. Um, you know, that you eat a pound of dirt to grow an inch, that kind of thing. But, but, but if you are exposed to allergens in infancy, um, that is um, protective. If you're exposed to allergens, and by uh, not just allergens, but also pollution, once you become a toddler, that is not protective, that is harmful. So the exposures through life uh, change how you respond to eventually, how you, how you respond and turn on your allergic system or tur not turn on your allergic system. Any questions on how? Uh, Mary, thanks for a superb talk. A uh, couple separate questions. One, I just wondered, it's probably a separate talk, but I wondered if you could comment on patients with overlaps. Like I'm thinking of cystic fibrosis patients who are wheezers, COPD patients who are wheezers, and where they fit in. And then I just wondered if you'd make explicit what I think is implicit to the talk, which is, I think what you're saying is, you know, over time, those of us working in the space where we're seeing these patients, we should develop some comfort with prescribing these drugs and not assume that we can take care of all of them, or that they have to be seen in an aspect. But I want you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, should I do that one? I'll do that one first. Let me just. So, so right now, um, I used to do the application for these drugs myself for years, and it would take hours hours. It was insane, but the patients got the drugs. Now the infusion suite is doing it, and it really, really facil facilitates things so, so much. Um, so, also there are infusion seats throughout the city. So, getting a hold of the drug, getting the authorization to the drug is really tough. But once you've got that, the patient would still be your patient. Now, can you can you order it into the infusion suite and not be approved by the infusion suite? I think right now we're not yet at that place. I think that's definitely coming. These drugs are very expensive, but they're they're not toxic. They have a very good safety profile. So I would anticipate that 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 would be coming. Dupilumab, the the third drug, the IL four IL thirteen drug, is not given in the infusion suite. The patient does it themselves. So we're looking at a, a real, this is definitely coming, that it's going to be more and more in the primary care practices. Uh, right now, I think it needs a referral just to get the process started, but that's not going to continue. Uh, I can't believe that they're going to still make it so difficult to get these drugs when they're, when they're so effective, so life-changing for the patient. So, so I think we have to see how this progresses. For people who live in remote areas, this is a big issue. You can't go travel 500 miles every once a month to get a shot, uh, but you can get you can give yourself the dupilumab. Um, so, how this is going to play out in terms of the logistics? Right now, to me, the the biggest logistic barrier is getting approved by the insurance and getting if you need to get a grant to cover cover the copay is the biggest. It's a tedious bother. Um, but that's, I think that's going to change. And I think, and, and why I thought this was so important was this is, you're seeing the patients in primary care clinics, in primary mm -hmm. care offices, uh, and, and you've been taking care of them and, and struggling along because we didn't have these tools. Um, and, so, and so now these patients, everybody should be alert in the primary care setting that these drugs are available mm -hmm. and that um, at this point still send them so we can put the orders in and get it going. But I would anticipate that that was, would change. And also within the Mount Sinai system, they're trying to make it more convenient for people. You know, we used to send people for um, allergy shots, and the whole deal there was how efficient was the office. If that office was going to make me sit there for three hours, I'm not going to that doctor. didn't matter with the doctor. It was how efficient were they able to get in and out. And some allergists had it down to chup, 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 out you go, chup, 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 and the others you would sit there. So we learn from that. Um, it has to be convenient. You have to go to work. 
Uh, and so uh, what Mount Sinai uh, system is thinking is, let's get the zip code of the patient and send them to the infusion suite, which is most appropriate for their zip code. I think that's really smart. Um, so, so right now, we're looking at uh, infusion suite for MEPO or Benra. Um, you can give Benra in the office if you get the approval. Um, the uh, dupilumab, the patient will be able to do it themselves. Then look at that placebo effect. Why did that, those patients get such a big placebo effect? Was it because they were showing up? Do we, how, how well will our patients be able to handle giving themselves a shot on a monthly basis? How compliance will that be an issue? For some patients, it will be. For lots of patients, it won't be. But for some patients, it will be. So all of these things have to come. We sort of have to get worked out because there's a lot administratively that seems to happen. Then for the asthma COPD overlap patients, well, we have two different groups. We have patients who have COPD and have eosinophilia, okay, and they don't have asthma COPD overlap. They just they have eosinophilia. And they definitely do better on inhaled corticosteroids early on in their course. So we used to, you know, we used to say once you got a, to severe COPD, we would add the inhaled corticosteroids. Then we found out that those patients had, were getting more pneumonia. So this trend was to switch to just giving them a llama and a lava. And we'd save the inhaled corticosteroid for the very severe. But now we know that if they are just severe and, and they have eosinophilia, we start the inhaled corticosteroid steroid earlier. But if they have eosinophilia and the studies looking at giving those patients with COPD without asthma, COPD uh, biologics doesn't work. So for the COPD with eosinophilia but doesn't have asthma, inhaled corticosteroid earlier, not the biologic. Now you've got the person who's got asthma and COPD. Well, if they've got eosinophilic asthma, they've got a eosinophilic asthma. And I'm going to approach them as they have a eosinophilic asthma. Cystic fibrosis, different altogether, um, they get um, ABPA. They get allergic. They get, um, um, you know, uh, IgE-related disease as well. And certainly the cystic fibrosis with ABPA is going to go on omelizumab. Um, and what was the third question? That was it. Okay. Uh, we have one more. This is more to think about the future. And that is, what is the role of vaping going to play in all of this? Which has increased the tobacco <laughs> And what does the tobacco vape look like for some of the ones who are dying because they have post mortems now? And the tobacco vapes are ingesting the, the substances that not, we don't even know that some of them are. Yeah, we've been waiting for this disaster to happen, <laughs> and it happened. So um, it's tragic. The whole thing is tragic because of the the lung disease and the deaths, but also the um, the, the the absolute the amount of nicotine you get when you're vaping is extraordinary. It's way more than you would get with a cigarette, and especially with the jewel. And uh, the Juul, one, one pod gives you a pack of cigarettes. The newer pods give four or five packs of cigarettes in one pod. And these kids are puffing on it all day long. They don't smoke a cigarette and put it out. They smoke, 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 smoke all day long. And if you think you can get those things away from teenagers, you're crazy. So I don't know, Norma. I think we need big muscle to stop this for sure. John? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's so many people out there who could have a different life because they won't be in the ER and getting prednisone twice a year like or 10 times a year. Right. Right. Yep. 
I'm with you all the way. Yeah, completely. <laughs> oh, here's Dr. Demexi, and so good to see you. Thank you. You know, I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew why there was such a huge placebo effect. Um, is it that they're showing up? Maybe. And that if you have to show up, you're thinking about your medication, so maybe you're taking your Simbacort better than you would have if you weren't having to show up. It's amazing, amazing. I wish we knew the answer. It's like bronchial thermoplasty. That gets the biggest placebo effect of all. I, I think, huge. You know, part of the answer there is that fact we now have It's real. Right.